So in 1953, there was a young man, about 27 years old, I believe, Henry Gustav Molaison, who was living in Connecticut. And he had had seizures since he was young. And they, the seizures were so frequent, they were daily, uh, and they were uh, strong enough that they totally interrupted his ability to, to make a life for himself. Interrupted school, they interrupted his ability to work. And he went, he was under the care of a nurse surgeon named William Scoville, a local nurse surgeon, who decided that um, he would, one of, one of the ways to treat epilepsy is to take out the piece of the, uh, of the cortex that is giving rise to the seizures. And so Scoville determined that this was coming from his temporal lobe, which is the typical uh, source of seizures. The typical epileptic focus, what's called epileptic focus, is in the temporal lobe. So uh, Scoville took out the anterior part of the temporal lobe on both sides. When Henry Molaison woke up, it quickly became apparent to Scoville that Henry Molaison did, every time he woke up, it was a new event. Uh, he'd say, hi, my name is Dr. Scoville. Do you, do you remember where you are? Uh, oh, I just woke up for the first time. So uh, he realized that this individual, that Henry Molaison was no longer making any new memories. He took Malaysian, he collaborated with Brenda Milner, who was at McGill uh, Neurological Institute in Montreal, and they wrote up this, this uh, case. Uh, and from this case, and it was no, at, but at that time, or still today, what we typically do is we call patients by their initials. So Henry Malaysian was not known as Henry Malaysian until he died, which is a few years ago. He was known for, for most time for all time as HM, and he is still referred to uh, properly as HM. So they wrote up a case report about HM saying after bilateral temporal uh, uh, lobectomy, uh, an individual can no longer make memories. And although the, the temporal lobectomy took out both the amygdala and the hippocampus, they correctly intuited that it was the hippocampus that was responsible for this individual's lack, uh, uh, inability to make new memories. Brenda Milner and then at her student, Suzanne Corkin, uh, went on to study uh, HM for decades until his death. And in particular, uh, uh, af after a while, this became more Suzanne Corkin than Brenda Milner. It should be said that this was a very affecting uh, story. It became well known, and after this, there were never. There's never any situation where somebody would intentionally lesion both hippocampus, both hippocampi. Okay, so what did we learn by Brenda Milner's and Suzanne Corkin's study of HM? Uh, and and what we learned from their study of HM has been corroborated by studies of other lesioned patients, other patients with more selective lesions. So we know that the, uh, we know the role of, of the hippocampus in isolation um, without damage to the amygdala. And what we've also learned from studies in non-human animals, including non-human primates. What we learned are a few things. First of all, the, uh, the hippocampus is necessary for making one type of memory declarative memories, explicit memories. So there are a variety of types of explicit and declarative memories. One is, yesterday I took the train, the 515 train or the 550 train. That's a, an incident. I can remember it. I can only remember it using my hippocampus. Another one is, I just learned a new word. That word is groovy. Groovy, I now know what groovy means. There are other types of memories. One is working memory. What's your phone number? 365-3888. Okay, now I can go 365-3888, 365-3888. As long as I continue to repeat it, I know the phone number is 365-3888. That is, by the way, my childhood phone number. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll come back to that. 
So, uh, so as long as you repeat it, you have that in working memory. As long, it, the minute you stop repeating it, it vanishes. Working memory does not work as long as you're not using it, repeating it, saying it, keeping it in mind. Another type of memory is, I tell you, I'd like you to move, move the pen through this maze, but instead of looking at the paper, I want you to look at the mirror. And I'm going to prevent you from looking at the paper. I'm only going to give you access to looking at the mirror. So now you have to draw in reverse. The first time you do it, you're going to be slow. You're going to make lots of errors. The second time, you'll be less slow. You'll make fewer errors. By the tenth time, you can do it pretty well. That's a motor memory, or a motor memory, and that was preserved. He was, H.M. was no different at motor memories than he was than um, control individuals. So what that tells you is that the hippocampus is not responsible for working memory. It's not responsible for motor memory. And it's not, in, in, in fact, responsible for um, emotional memories. So implicit, what are called implicit memories. Let me give you uh, what I think is, is the easiest way to remember an implicit memory. There was a, uh, a neur French neurologist named Dr. Clopade. And he came into a, uh, a ward of what are called Korsakoff's patients. These are people with with advanced alcoholism. And in advanced alcoholism, the mammillary bodies uh, degenerate, and associated with that is a loss of, uh, of declarative memory. So a loss of the same thing that, that, is, uh, that you need the hippocampus for. So he comes into this ward, and he says, hi, my name is Dr. Kapad, and he, he, he shakes their hands. The next day, he comes in, and they, they shake his hands again, and they have no recall that they've ever met him. They, they don't know him. They don't know that they met anyone. It's not just that they don't remember his name. They don't remember meeting or shaking hands with anyone. But on the second day, what he does, instead of just shaking hands, he puts a pin in his hand. So as he shakes hands, they, they're, uh, they're stuck with a pin. And they, they withdraw because it's painful. OK, great. So now they've, they've shook hand, they shook hands with him, and they, they weren't that pleased about the outcome. On the third day, they come in, and he says, hi, my name is Dr. Klopad. No one, ever, no one rem remembers him. Uh, no one remembers meeting him. And yet, no one will shake his hand. Why won't they shake his hand? Because that's an implicit memory. So implicit memory is another uh, function that does not require the hippocampus. So a hippocampus is dedicated to declarative explicit memories. Now let's take a look at where the hippocampus is, and then we're going to look at how the hippocampus, uh, the, the role of the hippocampus in forming memories. Here is, uh, this, this is the third ventricle. Uh, thalamus is here, and, and here is the, this is the temporal lobe, and this beautiful structure right here is the hippocampus. What you, what you might see is that it's bordering on the um, lateral ventricle. This is the temporal horn of the lateral ventricle. And I told you a long time ago, or a few videos ago, that uh, there's no gray matter that borders on to the lateral ventricle. And that's still true, because between the hippocampus and the lateral ventricle is a white matter tract called the fimbria uh, and the fimbria is going to become the fornix. This is a connection between the hippocampus and the medial diencephalon, including the mammillary bodies and, and other regions in the di diencephalon. So that's one view of the hippocampus. And now we're going to take a, this is a axial or horizontal view through the brain. The front is here. The back is here. Here's the cerebellum. Here's the temporal lobe. And in fact, the, the hippocampus comes around. It's, it's largest at the temporal lobe, but it's also present here. And this little uh, curly cue right here is the hippocampus. OK. So let's go over to the board and, uh, and find out one more thing that HM taught us. Another thing that HM taught us was that there's a difference between a, a memory that's already made 
and a memory that you can now make in, for the future. So here we have HM from zero to the time of the operation and going forward. So what we learned right off the bat was that information from back here was still available. He knew all this stuff. He knew about his childhood. He knew about his family. He knew about past presidents. He knew who was president when he, uh, 53, I guess, was Eisenhower. So he knew that Eisenhower was president. Uh, and so what that tells you is that the hippocampus is, it may be responsible for making memories, but not for storing memories. And what we now think is that the hippocampus, you make memories using the hippocampus, but then they get shipped out to the neocortex. Okay. Now, if you asked him out here who's president, he still is going to say Eisenhower. When you tell him in the 80s that it's Ronald Reagan, he, he has a chuckle because that's an actor to him. That's a, a B-movie actor. Uh, so he, he cannot make movies, uh, he cannot make movies, he cannot make memories uh, moving forward. And this is, this is anterograde amnesia. And anterograde amnesia is, in fact, amnesia. This is, we call it anterograde amnesia as though there's a different type, but really amnesia is anterograde amnesia. It is the inability to take something from working memory and make a new declarative memory from it. Now, over time, and, and uh, you may have experienced this with somebody in your life. Uh, I, I, have, uh, I have a friend who died at 102, and starting in the, starting really around 95, her ability to make memories uh, started to decline. And what was really clear is that her ability to remember, so recall, the likeliest things that she was going to remember were the oldest things. And as she got even older, the, this marched back. And this is what we call retrograde amnesia. And there is a reason why retrograde amnesia happens. And that is because recall involves the hippocampus. So you make a memory. There's a, there's a memory that's made right here. You recall it. If it's an important memory, you, you recall it a lot of times. You might recall it several times in a day. And then every year or every week, you recall it dozens of times. And that makes this memory more, stronger. So there, there are two things there. One is that the more you recall it, the stronger it is. But with every recall, there is the potential for for a little change. So every recall, you can change that memory a little bit. Uh, I, I once witnessed a crime, and I was called in to testify. Uh, the, the police did not <laughs> remind me of my testimony, uh, my, my, I, my report at the, on the night of the crime. And sure enough, when I got up on the witness stand, I, I remembered it completely different. I think it was a, I don't know, brown car, and I remembered it as a green car. Um, I remembered it one type of car, and it was a different type of car. So. So memories are labile uh, with every re re recall and reconsolidation of a memory. There is the potential for change. The strongest memories are not only the oldest memories. That's more to the point. It's the memories that have been recalled the, the most. So if you have a memory right here that is very momentous, let's say this, uh, this is no longer HM, but... Uh, Let's say this is 9-11, and it was a very uh, moving day. It's a, it's a memory that you, you, uh, you recall uh, often and has strong emotions associated with it. That's a strong memory. That's going to last a lot longer than, say, the memory of how you happened to um, return home 
last Thursday, the, the route that you took last Thursday, or uh, to take a to take a annoying example, where your keys are, right? Where are your keys? Not a really momentous moment in life, and so it's hard hard to remember that. So when there's an when HM1 underwent the operation, there were. Uh, incidents that t took place, I can't remember how long this is, but this can be, this can happen in say, there's a, there's a car accident and there might be a, a short period of retrograde amnesia where there are no memories. Uh, it, it's the, the memory is too labile. It is not uh, set in stone. And so you can't access that memory. Um, but over time, you'll march, your memories will march back until you're back in childhood. And people that, that, uh, that have older people in their lives, you will see this. You'll, you'll see people getting their children confused with their parents and um, wondering where their parents are, et cetera, uh, parents who are long dead. Another uh, important uh, concept when we're talking about amnesia uh, or, or memory and recall is that the emotional content of an event is going to make it much more memorable. Uh, it reinforces, if you show individuals uh, a, a, a scene of a car accident versus a neutral accident, they re remember the, the crash site, just a picture of a crash site, much uh, they remember the details of that much better than they do of this neutral intersection with a couple of cars. Now, if you give them a uh, drug that blocks the sympathetic arousal that is associated with seeing the, the car crash and, and the devastation, um, then they, don't, they no longer uh, remember it better. So our, emotion, our body reaction to emotional scenes is reinforcing, it's strengthening uh, uh, memories. Finally, I, I want to um, caution you <laughs> that a popular notion of amnesia is the one put forward by, uh, by, by Hollywood. And this is in a number of, of films by um, Hitchcock and more recently films such as Regarding Henry uh, uh, and, and um, in fact, uh, what is it, 50 First Dates. The, these are all uh, predicated on the notion that the person can, per can perfectly well uh, remember going forward but can't remember anything in the past, which is exactly opposite of the biological fact. Uh, so Hollywood amnesia is going to be a common uh, image that people come into uh, and, and are, people are familiar with and believe in, um, but it is 100% not true. Now, more recently, there, there have been a few uh, cases where uh, there's at least one movie, Memento. I haven't seen it, but I am told that it more accurately um, uh, describes uh, uh, the true um, experience of amnesia. Okay, let's just end for one moment. Uh, we're going to move on to intelligences. I, and I should say that losing memory does not mean losing either intelligence or personality. I can tell you that, that my friend Carol taught me a lot about this because she progressively did lose uh, her memory, um, but she retained her personality until the, you know, until the very end when she, she was no longer herself. But, but for a long time, she had no, you, you, she'd ask a question, you'd tell her an answer. She'd ask the question again. You could go through a, a variety of scenarios and test out different scenarios. There were a few interesting things. One is that she kept on asking the same question. So there was some underlying memory there. There was some concept of, of linking in one moment with another moment. Um, but more importantly, her charm and her personality came through uh, even as the, the, the ability to make factual memories um, was, was profoundly impaired. Um, and intelligence is also uh, un, unaffected by um, memory. 
So I want to end with um, intelligence. Um, we no longer think of intelligence as, as one version, a G intelligence, a general intelligence. We think that there are lots of different intelligences, intelligences that are motor, intelligence that are perceptual, or um, intelligence that are more emotional or more mathematical or more verbal or spatial, et cetera. So we are, we are in a, a conglomeration, an accumulation of lots of different intelligences. No matter what the intelligence is that we're talking about, it is located in the cerebral cortex. And what's interesting about uh, intellectual disability, uh, in any impairment of intelligence, is it, it, it is that it, it, first of all, it's incredibly common. There's about one to three percent of the of the population, which is an enormous uh, proportion of people that have uh, intellectual disability. And the second important interesting thing is that you can get it in lots of different ways. You can get it with a brain that's too big or a brain that's too small. One of the uh, examples of getting it getting intellectual disability with a brain that is too small, uh, has recently come to light with the Zika virus, which uh, increases the likelihood that a, um, an, a fetus will um, have a small telencephalon, a small cerebral hemisphere, which in turn produces a small head. For some reason, the, the, uh, the uh, press likes to call this small head. The point is that it's a small brain, which then is covered by a small head. So these are microcephaly, um, and, and depending on where, when in gestation the insult takes place, you can have either a really, uh, a, a very profound reduction in uh, the size of the telencephalon or a, a more moderate um, reduction. And these are gonna give you different, um, different results. I just wanna say that, that what's really, fascinating um, uh, truth that I, I realized pretty recently is that this is not about having a small cortex. I recently saw an image of a person with an arachnoid cyst. Now, an arachnoid cyst is a completely benign condition. And in general, these, these are asymptomatic and people don't even know they have them. And once they're found out, they're not told about them for the most part. This arachnoid cyst that I saw was taking up about two thirds of the cranium. So the cerebral cortex it was confined to the other third of the cranium and the person was completely normal of normal intelligence. So what that tells you is that uh, is that it's not the amount of cerebral cortex, it's that it's the organization and the type of cerebral cortex that is giving rise to intelligence. How does that happen? We don't know. Um, unfortunately, for all of the intellectual disabilities, there is no treatment with one exception. So intellectual disability can come from uh, fragile X, from uh, Down syndrome, from uh, microcephaly, uh, from fetal alcohol syndrome, from a number of, of, of insults, um, either genetic uh, predispositions or genetic conditions or, or, or environmental insults. One, uh, one type of intellectual disability comes from a disease called phenylketonuria. And we'll look at that when, when we look at uh, neural signaling, but it is a failure to uh, properly metabolize phenylalanine into tyrosine. And there is a buildup of phenylalanine, which then has, a, has the effect of creating, um, uh, damaging the, the neocortex. So it can be completely uh, prevented if you prevent an individual from birth from taking in phenylalanine and you give them tyrosine. So if you prevent them from having this uh, amino acid, which is going to accumulate and damage the brain, they will not develop an uh, intellectual dis disability. Because this is so important, we do a heel stick on every newborn to make sure to test whether they have PKU or not. If they have PKU, they want to be immediately put onto a diet that prevents them from taking in phenylalanine. Okay.
we have done the forebrain. We are now going to move on to how we get nutrients in and out of the uh, brain.